session. First item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the November 19th meeting. Does anyone have any comments, questions, or corrections? Can I have a motion, please? Jim? Approve. Second. Second. All, uh, any discussion? Nope. All in favor? One Okay. It's, it's uh, one abstention. All right, the next item on the agenda. David Jacobson is requesting subdivision review to create a four lot subdivision located at 326 Ocean House Road plus amendments to the site plans for 326 Ocean House Road and 320 Ocean House Road, uh, the town hall lot, to connect to the parking lot. The application was deemed complete and a public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The plan will be reviewed under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance and section 19-9 site plan regulations. Okay, so can the applicant come up and summarize any changes that have been made since the last meeting? Thank you. Uh, John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, uh, representing Dr. David Jacobson, who is here this evening um, for Ocean House Common. Um, and also with me is uh, Steve Bradstreet and Amber from Ransom Consulting, who worked on the uh, stormwater management plan. Uh, so just to recap, uh, we are here to uh, seek approval for uh, the subdivision plan, uh, sub subdivision plan review, uh, the amended site plan for Ocean House Common phase one, and amended site plan for the town lot, um, which was approved, <coughs> the initial Approval was uh, done in 1991. We have, uh, uh, just to go back, we've, we, uh, our submission dated November 27th uh, to the planning board addressed all of Steve Harding's comments uh, in his letter of November 14th. Those have all been addressed, the plans have been revised um, accordingly, and those plans have been uh, resubmitted to the planning board. Those are the plans that you have in front of you. Uh, we've also addressed uh, Steve Hodding's latest comments in his letter uh, dated December 11th, um, which are also have been changed on the, on the uh, plans. Um, there were only, uh, actually there was only, other than stormwater, man, uh, stormwater uh, comments, there was only one comment that was made, uh, which we've revised on the plan, that had to do with the <coughs> reserve parking space detail um, on sheet L8, and that has been revised. And then uh, the other comments had to do with stormwater, which um, I'm gonna have Amber, uh, to uh, discuss those revisions uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, in Maureen's memo dated December 17th, uh, there were a couple items. One was under paragraph D, under traffic. Uh, she asked that we add a note to the plan that had to do with lot one access. So we've made that change. Um, that essentially says that access to lot one, which is on the corner of Ocean House Road, uh, be made from uh, Town Common Circle. So that's, that's been done. That's uh, labeled on the subdivision plan. Uh, the second comment from Marine's memo uh, was number of 11, paragraph 11, under road construction standards. Uh, she requested that we change two of the granite monuments, uh, which um, has also been done. And then uh, under paragraph N, um, stormwater, 
Um, this is what Amber is going to be talking about. Uh, because the full build out of the project exceeds one acre of impervious surface, it requires a DEP permit. And um, Ransom has been working on uh, the stormwater permit, and I believe it's it, the application is ready to be submitted. We wanted to just hold off until this meeting. Um, so that will be submitted um, this week. Um, and, uh, and then before I ask Amber to come up, uh, just a, one other uh, matter uh, is that I wanted to tell the board is that we received town council approval last Monday on the uh, three legal documents that we had before them. Uh, the first one was the parking license agreement, which allows Ocean House Common to use or to share up to and not exceeding 10 parking spaces in the rear of the, the town hall lot. Uh, the second one was a cross access easement, uh, which allows vehicular and pedestrian access to and from Ocean House Common to the town lot. And the third uh, legal document had to do with the drainage easement, uh, which allows the town of Cape Elizabeth um, or the Public Works Department to enter onto our property uh, for the maintenance of uh, some um, uh, of the maintenance of the infiltration basins, which are uh, very close to the common boundary line. So those three documents, which were all included in our November 1st submission in the booklet, um, have been approved by the town and, and they will be recorded. So that, uh, that summarizes the changes that have been made since we last met with you. And at this time, I'm gonna ask Amber to come up and talk about the stormwater. Grading and drainage plan. Good evening. My name is Amber Furland, and I work at Ransom. Um, Two of Steve Harding's comments, comments 10 and 11, were regarding confirming the stormwater treatment approach uh, on the site. At the time that he had um, provided these comments, we were still working with DEP to confirm our calculation approach. Um, we have received approval from DEP to move forward with the calculations we had previously. So no changes have occurred um, to the stormwater design or the stormwater report. Um, we just wanted to confirm with DEP that the way we were doing the calculation was acceptable. So there were no changes to the stormwater design or, or treatment calculations. Um, everything else remains the same. There's still the two underdrained filter swales. There's two focal points to provide treatment for the, um, the driveway and parking areas, and the buildings will have um, drip edges. Um, there are some permeable pavers on the walkway, and all of that provides the required treatment for DEP standards. And I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. So that, that concludes our, our presentation. Uh, be glad to answer any questions. Did you have a question, Peter? Can you pull the mic down? Yeah, it's just a clarification question. You can yeah, go no, ahead. I'll, I'll wait till after the end. Okay. All right. So does anybody have any quick questions for clarification of anything? Not substantive? Oh. Okay, great. So then the meeting is now open to public hearing. Anybody wishes to speak on this? Application, please come forward, say your name, and um, we'll give you three minutes to talk. 
Hi, my name's Suzanne McGinn. I live at 1180 Shore Road. I asked you guys a question earlier this spring about, um, about the vernal pool that was located at the lot. I know that it's too late and it's already been destroyed, but I want to tell you what happened after I left that meeting. Um, I went to and look at the documents and um, for the submission packet, and I saw that Lauren Stockwell in 2016 had done, uh, she's an environmental consultant, and she determined in spring of 2016 that the vernal pool was uh, considered not significant. It was a dry spring that year, and when I went back and I looked at weather underground for a April of 2016, it was unusually dry if you compare it to other years. So um, I then contacted, uh, well then all of a sudden out of the blue, I received a call, this, this meeting was televised, someone gave, um, contacted me, figured out who I was, and they, um, they said that they had looked at this property uh, prior to uh, Mr. Jacobson purchasing it, and they were given a document by Albert Frick Associates back in 2014 um, that was done for Peter Heffenreffer, the previous owner, to, and it was determined that it was a significant vernal pool. In fact, uh, there were fairy shrimp in that pool back in 2014. Um, so then I called uh, IF&W, a guy named Jason. He's the one who approved Lauren Stockwell report, it not being significant. Um, and then uh, he gave me the name of a woman named Al Allison Sirios at DEP, and she's the legal arm of DEP. So I just wanted to figure out, you know, how, how does this happen? Because I, I really honestly, it's happened, it's over, but how can we prevent this from happening again? Um, probably most importantly, because in our most recent town survey in 2017, um, the 10-year plan, which I, I don't know if you guys have read this, it says, um, on page 14 of the report, 97% of the residents strongly or moderately support efforts to prevent, perfect, protect environmental quality. Um, so I'm here today to try to protect environmental quality going forward. I'm wondering if as Cape Elizabeth, we could implement some sort of stricter guidelines, stricter than what happens at the state level, because there was obviously, according to Allison at DEP law offices, there are loopholes in the current legislation that protect uh, significant vernal pools. And I think you get the drift of what I'm saying. I'm hoping that you will consider, I think you're the right Suzanne, um, your time's up. Legal arm to help in this manner. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elisa Tarlow, and I just have a comment that I just want to make sure everyone is aware of. We own one of the lots that borders the back of this project. Um, and it's really not, and we've heard it referred to a few times in these proceedings as vacant space and open land and like vacant lots and things like that. And the land behind this project is actually residential backyards of people. And typically this project would have been built on the street, but because of special provisions that allowed, because of the desire for a town green, the special provisions allows for the commercial buildings to be built further back. And I just want everyone to be aware um, that this project is impacting residents and everything that happens impacts us more than it would if it was on the street like it typically would have been. And I just want everyone to be aware of that and to not think, oh, there's nothing around because we hear, we see everything now that this has been opened up and 
and it really is the backyard of families. And so it isn't a commercial area as much as it is. It's on Ocean House Road, but since it's all pulled back, it's actually impacting residents. So I just want everyone, when they're deciding on all the little details and considering all the things that will happen in the project, to just take a moment to remember that there are families that are living there and they will hear and they will see the lights and the noise and whatever is done and how it's constructed and all of that stuff. Thanks. Thank you. Is anyone else here to speak? Hi, my name is Nate Tuthaker. I'm here um, on behalf of uh, Fieldwinds LLC, who's one of the also one of the owners, like Lisa, of one of the abutting properties. Um, I just had a couple of questions for the applicant, um, kind of piggybacking off of Lisa's comments on the buffer zone easement. Um, I have copies of that. If anybody wants those for reference, you may have seen them before in previous materials. Um, the questions I had were basically just um, just to confirm that during this next phase of the development that everyone involved is aware of the easement uh, and that um, it's not to be impacted by any further development. Um, uh, similarly, uh, just wondering if there's gonna be any further tree clearing activity on the property. And if so, uh, what steps have been taken to ensure that the easement zone isn't impacted by the clearing? And last, uh, if the applicant could please explain whether the buffer zone's been clearly marked, and if so, what steps were taken to ensure that the boundary lines are marked correctly, uh, such as whether there's been any land surveying doing the work. Uh, and that's it, thank you. Okay, is there anybody else wishing to speak? Seeing nobody, the hearing's closed. Um, John, would you like to answer the question about the buffer? It seems pretty straightforward. Uh, so the the buffer has, we've taken, um, we've gone to great lengths to make sure that the, uh, the 100 foot wooded buffer is well marked. Um, there are stakes um, every, uh, every so many feet along the entire length of the wooded buffer. Um, and uh, LP Murray, who is the site contractor, uh, is well aware of um, the limits of the clearing. Um, in terms of the uh, property line, the property line, uh, there are several uh, existing iron pins that are out there that delineate the, uh, the perimeter of the property and uh, where there aren't Prop, uh, property monumentation, uh, we have proposed iron pins um, at, those, at those various corners. There will also be uh, iron pins uh, delineating each of the four lots, um, and as well as granite monuments delineating the, um, the roadway. All right, so I'll open it up to the board. Do you guys have any questions or comments? Or? Um, were we given that? I don't remember that frick. The, 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 the no, it's no. never been provided. No. The, the, the current applicant, you may want to ask the current applicant yeah. to explain the presence or absence of a vernal pool. Yeah, do you have any information on that, John? The, uh, the, I don't remember the woman's name about the 2014 study by Albert Frick that says it was a significant pool. Right, we're the ones that hired Lawrence Stockwell. Yeah. Um, couple of years ago and she went out and um, determined that it wasn't a vernal pool. Um, and that report was, uh, my understanding is that report was registered with IFNW. We didn't register it, but someone else had registered it. 
therefore DEP uh, made the determination that uh, we could go forward, that it wasn't a vernal pool or a significant vernal pool, and that we could go forward with the project. Can I ask a question then, yeah. uh, follow up on that? Uh, whose onus is it then to look at prior record? Uh, I mean, I guess if a study had been done that had basically been a private study and not released, then I, I guess, you know, if it's not released, nobody can a have access to it. But if it was something that was submitted to DEP or run through DEP, is the onus on the applicants to do essentially a search for prior record on this with DEP? I mean, I don't know how this is approached, to be honest. So I'm gonna start and I'm gonna let the applicant. There, there's two levels of rules, well, there's, there's three levels of rules here. The town is responsible for administering our local rules. In our local rules, we protect vernal pools as a wetland and the town has granted a permit for that wetland to be altered. So uh, the town has administered its rule properly. The next level you look at is the state rules. And um, we do not administer the DEP rules. They're administered by the state. They have staff people that do it. Um, just because you find uh, spotted salamander or fairy shrimp eggs doesn't mean it's a significant vernal pool. So the state has a definition of what a significant vernal pool is and it's the state's responsibility to determine if something is a significant vernal pool. Um, it also doesn't, I mean, I'm not a wetland expert, but it doesn't really matter so much if it's a dry spring, because if you remember when we were looking at Maxwell Woods, the DEP visited that site not once but twice at the request of applicants of abutters to, because they asserted it was a vernal pool and there was a big huge puddle there but they determined that there was not enough egg masses or any egg masses to qualify as a vernal pool. So it really is a scientific determination. It's a definition that the state has, has established that's the difference between any old vernal pool and a significant vernal pool and it's a significant vernal pool that triggers the state regulations. And so my understanding is that the applicant hired a professional who evaluated that property, determined that there was not a significant vernal pool there, and then under state rules, they're allowed to register that study. And I don't believe there's any requirement that you have to search for any other studies. And in fact, those studies may not be public information. I mean, a property owner may do a study and keep it in their pocket and we wouldn't necessarily have access to it. Do you wanna, I don't know if the applicant wants to do add. Do you wanna add anything to that? Good, Jonathan? I just wanna say one issue. I mean, the application that we have in front of us is for subdivision of the previously approved um, application which came in front of us uh, probably about six months ago. Um, at that time would have been the time for information about a vernal pool to come forward and now we're bringing something back in Monday morning quarterbacking something that we've already looked at and examined and determined that there wasn't a vernal pool at that time from the information we had. Um, I understand that there, there is a concern to protect the environment. I'm 100% for that um, and if the people of the Cape Elizabeth really want to make this, the laws and the ordinances stricter, then they should be going to the town council. Um, but what all we can do is look at the application in front of us, look at the ordinance that we are controlled by, and then make a determination. We made that determination last spring with regards to the issue of um, the, the village green, and now we're faced with an um, application to amend the previously approved project just for subdivision. So I really think that we need to keep our eye on the ball when it comes to that and um, go forward with what's in front of us tonight. You are correct. Yeah, I agree, Jonathan, thank you. So, moving forward. Would anybody wanna move forward, Peter? Different topic? Yes, please. I think this would be for Amber, if you would never. The, um, it appears from the, the background that we've been given, there was a unexpected um, 
and I guess disappointing uh, capacity of, of the lot two uh, infiltration uh, characteristics to absorb groundwater. And I'm, I'm not clear as to exactly where that stands right now. Could you review that situation for us? That's part of the reason why um, Steve Harding had the comments he did, numbers 10 and 11 in the comment response letter. Um, the test pits we were hoping would confirm what the county soil survey showed as um, type AB soils, which are really well um, infiltrating soils. The test pits actually showed CD soils, which are really poorly draining, which then changed, um, it didn't change our calculation, it's just changed the way that we accounted for impervious areas um, draining to um, the project site. So instead of accounting for infiltrating into the village green, which we were hoping to do, um, we can't do that. So we needed to account for treatment in the um, underdrain filter swales. Um, we were able to, by talking to DEP, account for the offsite areas draining to the site. That, yep. that put us in compliance with the DEP treatment standards. Is that part of the business about installing the J drains, which would go into the dispersal system? Yeah, um, that was a recommendation Steve Harding had as well, just since that's gonna be a highly used space, um, more of a park area, we'd like to keep that dry. So that kind of just confirmed getting CD soils, it makes sense to have that more underdrained. Could you, then you're saying that Steve Harding's letter of December 11 says everything is good? Is, is that your position, that Steve Harding's letter of December 11 says that the situation? Yeah, hold on, Peter wants to. Oh, sorry. Wants to. I, I, would say, I would say that the December 11th letter from Steve Harding does not say everything's good. That was my impression. Right. Yeah. But, there, but the applicant, after the, 11, after the um, letter came out, Steve and the applicant's engineer have been working through these issues, and now everything is good, in theory. And I think I copied you on some emails that were back and forth between the engineer and the applicant and are also in the town file for anyone to review. And the, please correct me if I'm wrong, sure. but I've been, I've been closely involved and I feel bad for anyone that got dropped in the middle of this. So there were a couple of issues. Uh, the, the one issue, of course, is we want this area to not be a big, huge puddle. Right. And, and the way that seems to have been addressed is by the recommendation from Steve Harding to add J drains. The applicants have agreed to do that. Uh, the other problem was really more of a DEP appending problem. This, this applicant is going to need to submit an application to the DEP for a stormwater permit, and we want to do everything we can to make sure the design that's approved by the town is permittable by the DEP. If it's not, um, they're going to have to come back. And, you know, if they have to come back, they have to come back. That's the way it is. But anything we can do to try to make this, this move uh, more expeditiously seems reasonable. And so Steve had recommended that the applicants um, actually kind of recalculate the way they were going to present their information to the DEP. Uh, the two uh, drainage swales that are going to be built on the side of the town hall parking lot are treating a significant amount of impervious surface, and the applicants were really not taking credit for that in their DEP application. Once they take credit for it, their amount of area that they're treating goes above the minimum percentage required by DEP. So what you're seeing in front of you, there's not a lot of changes. Um, there was concern when the test pits came out the way they did. Um, there was, at one point, the applicant was looking at adding a third focal point, which nobody was that excited about. Uh, and through working together with the town engineer, I've come to the conclusion that the two focal points are okay, the J drains will work, and um, it looks, the, the applicant has also reached out to DEP as, as we requested to try to figure out where were they. And based on the conversations they've had with the DEP and what they've reported to us, it looks like they, they're, they're back on track. So the situation, fair to say, is that Steve Harding and the applicant think things are copacetic, but we're still going to have to see what the DEP says. Yeah. And if we approve it, hypothetically now, the DEP had some changes, they would have to come back in and 
Yes, the motion that um, I have provided for the board to consider uh, specifically requires that the applicant not be allowed to record the subdivision plan until the uh, DEP permits have been obtained. Uh, if it takes more than 90 days, I've, I've advised the applicant to keep track of that permit so they can come back to the board and ask for an extension. Uh, We've actually had some positive things. There's a pre-application meeting that the applicant is required to have with the DEP. The town had asked the applicant to meet with the DEP months ago, and the DEP has agreed that that can now be considered their pre-application meeting. So um, their timing is now looking much, much better. Thank you. I, have a, I just want to clarify. I, I was confused. So page five of your report, uh, your report is conclusions and I can you just walk this was like pretty dense and I was just trying to understand it and I think it goes to this whole thing about it not quite working maybe as well as but it talks about flow going around analysis point four can you just like basically walk me through on the map like what exactly this all means um, for sure yeah Sure. Um, is there a specific part in the conclusion you're looking at? Well, I mean, I, I was particularly looking at um, the second paragraph talks about flow sort of not going, going. I don't know where analysis point four is. It's it just the language and stuff is a little bit different from, you know, we're talking about in, uh, filtration points and th things. So I just, I'm just trying to like visualize what you're ta talking about here and I didn't really understand it. We're going to pull up a map which shows where the analysis points are. Okay. So in paragraph two, I mean, essentially what this is summarizing is this is summarizing that the drainage area, you can kind of see this red outline here. This outline here is indicating that all of the area included here is draining in this direction. The area here capturing the rear of the buildings is draining to the existing buffer easement. All of the area internally here is all draining towards the village green, either being captured by the focal points here or by the underdrain uh, filter swales here and here. The majority of this area is draining towards the village green into a proposed catch basin, which then connects to the existing drainage system um, that the town owns. Basically, that's a technical way of stating that all of the area that's draining to each of these study points, yeah. all the areas that the stormwater leaves the site, has been analyzed. Okay. Um. So I guess I was just trying to figure out how, if there's an issue then with, it says, as a result of future development and anticipated grading, some of the stormwater from subcatchment two now flows directly to now point four without being able to direct the flow towards filtration area. So is it not being treated then? Is that, as I'm to understand it? It's being treated. It's just stating that the rear of these buildings, the buildings are pitched mm -hmm. lengthwise. So there isn't a way for us to capture the runoff from the rear of these buildings right, to going, bring it okay. towards the village green. It sheet flows this way, but it's captured and treated in a building drip edge before it goes off site. And then it just infiltrates in the, buff, the buffer there? Yep, okay. exactly. All right, thanks. So I have a question. Is it possible when the lots three and four develop that a building could be designed that would upset this scheme substantially or would it just be minimal? If the buildings were to be proposed differently, I believe we have conditions in there that the buildings need to be treated with a drip edge. Um, if they were to change the configuration substantially. Um, well, let's say, you, I mean, you wouldn't do it, but if you pitched it all forward and you lost all the water going out the back, sure. would, is this robust enough that to would, sustain that? Yeah, and that would actually be better. They would just need to size the drip edge, for instance, on this building, if all of it were to pitch in this direction, their drip edge would need to be sized accordingly to treat the entire roof area 
where in this case right now we're saying half of the building should be treated here and this half the building should be treated here. They're, they're ultimately responsible for treating the, um, the roof in whatever direction they pitch it. Okay, so that's one question on that point. It's actually for Maureen. Maureen, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but every one of these buildings uh, for lots one, three, and four um, have to come in front of the planning board for uh, approval, correct? Yes, each one would need site plan review and there's actually a specific note on the subdivision plan that explicitly says it has to come in for site plan review and I mean, it's, there's more issues than just drainage. I mean, we're gonna have to check parking, landscaping, Traffic architecture, studies. yeah, all of that stuff. And okay. it's, it's pretty standard for site plan review. And it's all because it's in the town center? Nope, it, it's a non-residential building. Okay. Pretty much any non-residential building construction is going to trigger site plan review. Right. Anything else? I just, uh, w one thing I just wanted to mention though, and this is going back um, to the prior approval. Uh, when we went on the sidewalk, I thought it was pretty clearly marked where the buffer um, was at that time, and it was, like I said, significant um, when it came to the back lots that um, that maintaining those very large pine trees and uh, the other uh, woods that were there, uh, I thought was um, one of the big things about this lot and, and measured into why I was approving the previous one. Um, so I think that the concerns that were raised today by a couple people with regards to buffering, I think that um, those have been addressed uh, by the applicant. Okay, would someone like to make a motion? I don't want to make a motion. I just need to say something. Okay, okay. before a motion is made, Maureen. So I did hand out a sheet for you tonight and that is a suggested motion for, uh, excuse me, condition for the planning board to consider based on a discovery this morning during construction. Um, I'll just remind you all that this building was built around 1905 when rules were a little different. Uh, apparently during construction next door this morning, two lines were discovered that originate in the town hall building. Really? Yep. That's sewer line, sewer line. Um, we're not sure. <laughs> um, one might be discontinued. One is, we, we're pretty sure one of them is a groundwater drainage line. The public works director put some dye in it in a drain in the basement, popped right out over there. Um, so we're suggesting, we're asking that the applicant, that you put a condition on the approval that basically just clarifies that the applicant will be coordinating with the town to address that and that the town is working on the design and the construction which the town would be responsible for. Do, do any members who attended school in this building have any insight into that? <laughs> <laughs> we spend most of our time on the, on the top floor. Right? Um, I, I have a motion for the board, but I just had one question um, for Maureen or the applicant, whoever can answer it. Um, because this, there's no longer any phasing in this project at this time, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, I have a motion for, um, motion to approve findings of fact. Uh, number one, David Jacobson in requesting subdivision review to create a four lot subdivision located at 326 Ocean House Road, plus amendments to the site plans for 326 Ocean House Road and 320 Ocean House Road Town Hall lot to connect to the parking lot, which requires review under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance and section 19-9 site plan regulations. Number two, the subdivision will not result in undue water pollution. Uh, the subdivision is not located in a 100-year floodplain. Soils will support the proposed uses. The slope of the land, proximate, uh, proximity to streams and state and local water resources rules and regulations will not be compromised by the project. Number three, the subdivision will have a sufficient quantity and quality of potable water. Number four, the subdivision will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. Number five, the subdivision will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular and pedestrian traffic. The subdivision provides for road network 
connectivity while discouraging through traffic. Roads are laid out to conform to existing topography as much as is feasible. All lots are provided with vehicular access. Roads are designed to meet town standards. Number six, the subdivision will provide for adequate sewage disposal. Number seven, the subdivision will provide for adequate solid waste disposal. Number eight, the subdivision will not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. Number nine, the subdivision is compatible with applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinances. Number 10, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. The sub number 11, the subdivision will not adversely impact surface water quality. Number 12, the subdivision will not adversely impact the quality or quantity of groundwater. Number 13, the subdivision is not located in the 100 year flood plan. plan. Uh, number 14, the subdivision is in compliance with the town wetland regulations in the zoning ordinance. Number 15, the proposed subdivision will provide for adequate stormwater management. Number 16, the subdivision is not located within the watershed of a great pond. Number 17, the subdivision is not located in more than one municipality. Municipality, municipality, excuse me. Number 18, the subdivision is not located on land where liquid uh, liquidation harvesting was conducted. Number 19, the subdivision does provide for access to direct sunlight. Number 20, the subdivision does provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the subdivision as appropriate and screening as needed. Number 21, the subdivision will comply with the open space impact fee uh, with the donation of 17,031 square feet of land, which is the Village Green 2, in payment of a fee in the amount of $12,420.46. Number 22, the subdivision lots will be provided with access to utilities. Number 23, the subdivision plan does not include a phasing plan. Number 24, the, 300, the 326 Ocean House Road site plan and town hall site plan have been previously approved by the town by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the site plan regulations and the findings and decisions of those approvals which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Number 25, the plan for the sites reflects the natural capabilities of the site to support development. Number 26, access to the sites will be on roads with adequate cap uh, capacity to support the traffic generated by the development access into and within the sites will be safe. Parking will be provided in accordance with sections 19-7-8 off street parking. Number 27, the sites will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site as appropriate and screening as needed. Number 28, the applications have substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 16-3-1 and the site plan regulation section 19-9. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of David Jacobson for subdivision review to create a four lot subdivision located at 326 Ocean, should it be Ocean House Road? Ocean House Road, plus amendments to the site plans for 326 Ocean House Road and 320 Ocean House Road, the town hall lot. Uh, to connect to the parking lot be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter dated December 11th, 2019. Number two, the monumentation be added to the plan in coordination with the plan, uh, excuse me, with the public works director. Number three, that lot one vehicular access be limited to town common circle. Number four, that an open space impact fee in the amount of $12,428.46 be paid prior to the recording of the subdivision plan. Number five, that the road maintenance agreement for town common circle be recorded with the subdivision plan. Number six, that any required DEP stormwater or site permits be obtained prior to recording of the subdivision plan. Number seven, that a deed for the village green two lot be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney and the town manager. Uh, number eight, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording uh, the subdivision plat. And number nine, that the applicant coordinate with the town of Cape Elizabeth to pick up existing drainage lines extending from the town hall to the applicant's property with design and construction costs to be borne by the town.
Second. Well, I got a couple. Well, okay. Well, I got a couple second. friendly yet. Second yeah. first. <laughs> okay, Jim. Yeah. Uh, I think number 13 and number 27 are duplicates and could be deleted. It doesn't hurt to delete men, but we said it twice. Uh, number 13, you said it in number two, in the paragraph number two, and number 27, you said it in 20, the way I read it. Yes. I noticed that as well, but is there any problem with repeating no, it? No, I just didn't know if it's, going to, if it's not going to be a problem, but, we can leave it. It's just I mean, redundant. I, I don't disagree with you. Um, for good or ill, the way these site, these standards are laid out is to mirror the way the state subdivision law is laid out. And when we went over the subdivision ordinance back in the good old days, the state subdivision standards are duplicative and um, could use some work. I withdraw my proposal. Any others? <laughs> okay, so seconded by Caroline. Okay, all in favor? It's unanimous, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda. The Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting amendments to a previously approved site plan for Portland Headlight located at Fort Williams Park to add hard landscaping to high traffic pedestrian areas. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations. So I assume we're reviewing for completeness first. Um, actually, the the it's been set up for an expedited review, so it would be completeness. And if it's deemed complete, you could hold a public hearing and consider approval tonight. Okay, take it away, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates, uh, representing the town of Cape Elizabeth for the site improvements at uh, Portland Headlight. Getting pretty fancy there, John. Uh, it's, it's, believe me, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. um, so as we presented to you in, your, in our workshop meeting, um, the site improvement project focus, focuses on enhancing uh, pedestrian improvements um, in and around the Portland headlight uh, to accommodate the increased number of visitors to the, to the headlight. Uh, this is a copy of the existing conditions plan and this is a copy of the proposed site plan. Um, so, uh, I think the best way to present this is to uh, to identify the uh, various site improvements. Um, these are viewing areas. There's um, viewing area one, viewing area two, and viewing area three. <clears throat> this is, these are the areas where the visitors tend to congregate to photograph um, the site and, and the views. And right now, uh, there's a lot of the, these areas where, which were designed to be grass. Uh, the grass has, has worn away, it's bare ground now, and there is erosion taking place, particularly on view, viewing area number one. So um, our, our design, uh, consists of removing the soil um, and to uh, pave these entire areas with uh, stone pavers. So that's, that's the first uh, site element. Um, we have included one bench uh, next to the museum gift shop located here. Uh, this bench is consistent with 
the benches that we used in the upper, the central parking parking lot, um, a granite curb, which is this uh, bold line here, um, is intended to replace uh, just a four by four piece of timber, uh, and it is used to uh, partly to retain the soil in this area. Um, Post and chain. We've got a, a number of areas uh, within this, uh, within the area that um, we have installed posts and chain. These are only, you know, 24 inch high uh, metal posts with um, with metal chains. Um, everything is, is um, coated so it won't it won't rust. Uh, but it's basically to control. Uh, the pedestrian circulation to keep people off grass areas, primarily. Uh, plantings, we've installed uh, some plantings in and around the ledge outcrops in this area here. And the final uh, improvement consists of re relocating the horn, which is currently in this location, over to um, an enclosed area. Um, I guess what was happening where kids were uh, climbing that, uh, the base of the, the horns, and uh, it, it becomes a safety issue because of the, the drop off here. So we've relocated it to this enclosed area. Uh, those, that's basically the extent of uh, the site improvements. Uh, we are asking for three waivers. Uh, topography will be very minimal changes to, uh, to the finished grade, uh, so there won't be uh, much grading at all. Uh, traffic study, there's no change in traffic patterns. And stormwater management was the third waiver that we're requesting, um, and the stormwater will not be altered. Um, Steve's, uh, Steve Harding's comments have been addressed. Uh, his one comment, um, or number one comment was had to do with seeding. He didn't see any notes on uh, s uh, lawn seeding. And we've explained in our response letter that um, this, this is gonna go out to bid shortly. And there's uh, a full set of written specifications that details the mixture of seed and the methods of seeding. Um, he just had a, a minor um, comment on the stone paver detail and the granite curb detail, which we have uh, amended. And, and then the final comment, um, this came from Marine's comment, uh, Marine's memo, had to do with erosion. Um, I mentioned uh, that there is uh, erosion occurring in this area here. That's primarily because <clears throat> it's bare ground. Uh, there is some topography in this area, and during heavy rains, we, we do experience uh, minimal erosion. Um, during construction, uh, we haven't shown any erosion uh, devices. Um, and the reason for that is because we're paving right up next to and abutting the, the fence uh, in, both, in all three uh, uh, viewing areas. And it would be impractical to, to install a uh, silt fence or erosion berm in those areas. They, they would just have to be removed um, in order to install the, the pavers. Um, so uh, we have, in, uh, in, the, um, in the contract specifications, we have uh, designated, we've, we've basically told the contractor that he has to uh, install one viewing area at a time. So in other words, he'll finish this and then he'll move to this area, finish it, and then move to this area and finish it. Um, and then in post-construction, um, uh, there should not be any erosion taking place because um, all of the areas that are now bare ground will be uh, surfaced with pavers. And that, 
that's about it for for the uh, for the site improvements for the Portland headlight. Okay, any quick questions? All right, so I'm gonna open this up for public comment. Is there anyone here to ask any questions or make comments about this application? Nope. Is this just on completeness? This is just on completeness, yes. Seeing none, the public comment session is closed. Uh, members of the board, do you have any questions for John? Comments? I, okay. I, I have a motion to consider for completeness. Go to it. All right, motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for pedestrian improvements at Portland Head Light, located at Fort Williams Park, be deemed complete. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Um, okay, so as you all know, this is uh, the applicant has requested an expedited application. So um, we can move right on to consider the application. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the application or discussion? I just wanted to point out, we went to workshop on this um, with the applicant, gave us some extensive information on this, which is reflected up here. Um, I'm glad to see these improvements being made. I, I know for a fact from visiting there, there's a lot of bare spots with no grass and mostly just dirt, so I think that this would be improved. Um, I like the inclusion of park bench, which we could have more, but I understand uh, that the applicant um, uh, uh, kind of restricted the amount of park benches that were allowed, so. Okay, so again, I'm gonna open the public, the, the meeting to a public hearing. Seeing nobody again, uh, public hearing is closed. Um, I don't think we need a site walk. All right. Well, if there are no further discussion, questions. So I got a motion for approval if I'm ready. Oh, Carol Ann, did you? Motion for, motion for approval. Uh, the Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting amendments to a previously approved site plan for Portland Headlight located at Fort Williams Park to add hard landscaping to high traffic pedestrian areas which requires review for compliance with section 19-9. Two, the Portland Headlight site plan has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance the site plan regulations and the findings and decisions of that approval which are not altered uh, by the proposed amendments re remain in effect. The plan three, the plan for the development reflects the natural capabilities of the, of the site to support development. Four, the plan does provide for a system of pedestrian ways within the site. Five, the plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. Six, the development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted. Seven, the development will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of any adjacent water body. Um, eight, are we providing a vegetative buffer? I just, we got, not really providing a vegetative buffer. There's some plantings in the viewing area. Oh, that's too, true, we are, okay. The vellum will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site and screening is needed. Nine, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 10, the applicant, application substantially complies with the standards of section 19-9 site plan review. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for pedestrian improvements at Portland Headlight, located at Fort Williams Park, be approved subject to the following condition. One, that the site plans be revised to reflect the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated December 10th, 2019. I have a second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you, John. Thank you very much.
Okay, the next item on the agenda. Adam Gardner is requesting an amendment to the previously approved private access way granted for 12th Paputic Drive to enlarge the building envelope. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 197-9 private access ways. And we're here for completeness first. Go ahead. Hi, this is Adam. Uh, I'm basically just trying to adjust the building envelope so I can uh, build a pool in my backyard for my wife and two kids. We live in uh, 12 Perpudic Drive, so we're basically across from Maxwell's and Spurwink Road there, down the private drive there, and it abuts Perpudic Golf Club, and you'll see in your packet, we have a letter of approval from them to move forward with a land swap, which will allow for us to ultimately change our uh, building envelope and will allow for us to have proper setbacks for our pool. And that's it. Yes, I'm Adam Gardner. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a public uh, comment on completeness. Anybody here for that? Okay, then the public comment is closed. Board members? It's pretty straightforward, I don't know. So, and I think, I think we have all the information we need to make a decision. Would you like a motion? I would. <laughs> Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials. No, so wait. Don't we, we need complete no, Yeah, yes. that's what I'm going to make a motion on, oh, okay. completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of Adam Gardner for an amendment to the previously approved private access way permit for 12 Perpudic Drive be expanded to, to expand the building envelope be deemed complete. Second. Discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Motion passes. Um, does anybody see a need for a site walk? No. Does anybody have any discussion? Mm -hmm. I'm not opening for public hearing. You need to. <laughs> Go, just say it, Joe. Okay. Just say it, Joe. You need to. Meeting is open for public hearing. Seeing no one, public hearing is closed. I have a motion for approval. Uh, number one, Adam Gardner is requesting an amendment to the previously approved private access permit for 12 Perpudic Drive to expand the building envelope as part of a land swap with the budding property Perpudic Golf Club, which requires review under section 19-7-9 private access way. Number two, the Perpudic Drive private access way has been previously approved by the planning by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the site plan regulations and the findings and decisions of those approvals which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Uh, number three, the building envelope is depicted wherein the house and the accessory building will be located on the lot demonstrating conformance with the setback requirements of the district in which it is located in any natural constraints and that the house site will be buffered from abutting residential properties. Number four, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access ways. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of Adam Gardner for an amendment to the previously approved private access permit for 12 pup, 12 Pudic Drive to expand the building envelope be approved. Second. Second. Carol Ann, all in favor? It's unanimous, the motion passes. Okay, next item on the agenda. Cadence Way Private Road Amendment. Maxwell Cove LLC is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Cadence Way Private Road approval located at 51 Ocean House Road to adjust the lot line. The lot is located in the RC district with a minimum lot size of 20,000 square feet. And the area of the private road right of way was inadvertently included in the lot size. The lot must be at least 20,000 square foot exclusive of the private road right of way. No change to the physical layout of the project are proposed. 
The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1979 private road review. So um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and the project. Uh, my name is Jay Cox, Sawyer Road. I'm here for Maxwell Cove LLC, which is myself and Bill Royal. Here to discuss Cadence Way, located at 51 Ocean House Road. This is Ocean House and this is Spurwink right here. So it's uh, close to Spurwink, just about across from, well, it's three lots down from Spurwink and Ocean House. Um, this plan was, the plan that I'm gonna put up was approved and recorded in May of this year. I'm back here because subsequent, subsequent to the recording, I noticed I made a mistake in the plan. We failed to reduce the front lot. Actually, let me get that one up. What we did was, uh, failed to reduce this front lot by the area of the private road right away. This hashed portion, the private access way portion right away does not need to be, is not deducted from the land area of the lot. So basically we failed to uh, reduce the lot size by this, this area right here, which is, uh, That renders this lot 1,335 square feet short, or 18,665 18, square feet. <coughs> um, I'm hoping to correct this oversight by moving the property line between the two lots, which we do still loan, own, fortunately. Uh, this would result in a back lot of 26,219 square feet and a front lot of 23,265 square feet up here. And once this area is backed out, uh, that gives us uh, 20,891 square feet in the front lot, which is obviously um, greater than the 20,000 square feet uh, required. Initially, and the way that this uh, plan is recorded, this property dividing line runs just, it's a straight line right down between property line to property line. And the way we accomplished adding area is by putting this jog along the right-of-way area and essentially adding this area to the front lot. Uh, there are no other, no other changes. Um, the drive location, uh, rights-of-way, turnaround, monuments, frontage, everything else is uh, exactly the same as approved and constructed. Uh, the road has been certified by Sebago Technics. Uh, the only change to the property, the only change is the property line uh, modified to move uh, the stated area from the back lot to the front lot. And that's, that's, that's the entirety of my request. I, I'm ready for any questions. Questions? Meeting is open to public comment. Seeing none, meeting is closed to public comment. Um, we don't need a sidewalk. And? And, Carol, and again, sorry. this is pretty straightforward, and uh, we do need a motion for completeness. Okay. Uh, and while he was talking, I roughed out a motion for completeness. So. Um, do we need for an amendment? It says so that this is a hearing for completeness and a public hearing. Is the procedure true? section said, yeah, you need one, and then I never gave you one. Honestly, we're, we are at such a minor level, I don't think it matters one way or the I can other. Do it, I mean, we can do it either way. Go ahead. Let's just do the complete. Just, just do it? Just do it. <laughs> Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of Maxwell Cove LLC for an amendment to the previously approved private road for Cadence Way be be deemed complete. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, would someone like to? Well, I have one question now to okay. substance. Can I? Yes. And I'm sure this is fine, but I just wanted to ask, in the past or in the previous form of this, 
where you said the lot, lots were basically split directly down. Part of that road obviously was owned, part of the access piece of the road was owned by the, the back lot. It's now basically all in the hands of the front lot. I mean, that's still all within an easement though, so there's no, there mean no issues of somebody you know, dumping into that, the end of it, even though they don't own any portion of it, essentially. I just want to make sure that's absolutely true. There's, there's a, a recorded uh, joint maintenance agreement where both parties have to get together tw uh, once a year and decide who's going to clear the road and maintain the road and how it's, what's going to be spent to maintain it. Mm -hmm. So they're jointly responsible regardless. Um, the This portion right here is all that really changed right. ownership, but in, in, in reality, it doesn't make any difference because they both have the rights to use the road right. and they both have the responsibility to ma maintain the road. That, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure there was, there was nothing that absolutely, nothing that would affect that in this change, so. Okay. I want to ask, who seconded that motion? I don't know. Do you think Jim did? Yeah. You seconded the motion. I did. Didn't you? Yeah, Jim. Was there a vote? There was, and it was unanimous. Mm -hmm. I somehow missed it. <laughs> it was so fast. We're ramming it through. First one since I've been there. here. So. <laughs> okay, so again, meeting's open to public comment. Seeing none, it's closed to public comment. Does anyone have any further questions? on the application or comments. Okay, can I have a motion? You want to do this one, John? I haven't done one in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Should we let someone who hasn't done one yet? Yeah, water <laughs> water <laughs> back. I'm let somebody else talk. Can I do a motion? Yes, I haven't done do one. Do a motion. 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 Do a Motion for the board to consider findings of facts. Maxwell Cove LLC is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Cadence Way private road approval located at 51 Ocean House Road to adjust the lot line, which requires a review under section 197-9 private road review. That's number one. Number two, the Cadence Way private road plans have been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the private road requirements, section 19-7-9 and the findings and decisions of that approval which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Number three, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private road standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Maxwell Cove LLC for amendments to the previously approved Cadence Way private road located at 51 Ocean House Road, be approved. Second. I'll second. Um, all in favor? It's unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you, folks. Okay. All right, next item, 1234 Shore Road Subdivision Site Plan Amendments. Seacoast Properties Incorporated is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Pond Cove Subdivision, <coughs> excuse me, and amendments to the previously approved 1234 Shore Road Site Plan that update approvals with current zoning requirements, but include little to no change to the developed site. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 16-2-5, amendments to a previously approved subdivision and section 19-9-6 site plan amendments. Uh, the board will first consider whether the application is complete. Fletcher, I'm uh, here for the applicant, Seacoast Properties. 
And as mentioned, this relates to 1234 Shore Road, which is at the corner of Ocean House Road and Shore Road. It's the former Key Bank building um, that uh, has been vacant now for a few years. And we're, we're here for two sort of related purposes. One is this lot is lot one of the Pond Cove subdivision that was created back in 1988. And at the time it was created, the town didn't have the robust zoning it has today. And the planning board at that time included on the approved subdivision plan a note seven, and that note seven included a reference to any future changes of use requiring planning board approval. And so one part of what we're requesting, requesting tonight is to allow any future uses to be governed by the existing zoning that's in place today that has the hierarchy of uses. Um, the second change relates to um, uh, changing to category three use, which is for personal services and retail. Uh, my client is discussing with a prospective tenant potential use as a florist retail shop. Um, formerly, this is uh, was a key, uh, Casco Northern Bank originally, um, and the site plan was approved in 1990, and then Key Bank used this um, facility. And when they sold the facility, they placed a deed restriction that wouldn't allow any banking-related uses until 2024. So while that may be considered as a future use, in the meantime, we'd, our, my client would like to see this property used um, potentially for retail purposes and is talking to a tenant um, currently. And so those are the two um, requ requested changes that we're here uh, to request tonight. And I'll just note a couple of things. Since the date of the plan that's included within your packet, there, one, there is one change and it's shown on the plan that uh, I'm presenting tonight. And that is to locate a dumpster in the rear um, of the lot, which would take up two parking spaces, but would still allow adequate parking um, that's required under the, the current zone. And the other um, point I would add is, as Maureen po pointed out in her memo, um, uh, we did want to note that um, we don't believe that uh, the retail use, uh, particularly as a potential florist shop, would have any elevated um, you know, noise levels and would comply with the, with the current zoning requirements in terms of um, the de decibel levels that are allowed within that zone, which as I understand it are 65 decibels from the hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then 55 decibels from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And based on our research, um, you know, the office use, the banking use, and the, the modest size retail use are pretty consistent decibel levels in the range of you know, 50 to 55. So we don't see any um, added level of activity or noise associated with this retail use. So I welcome any questions. Any quick questions on, compl on completeness? Okay, the meeting's open to public hearing. Seeing nobody, um, we're close to public hearing. Uh, would anybody like to make a motion? Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Seacoast Properties Inc. for amendment to a previously approved Pond Cove subdivision to remove a note and amendments to the previously approved 1234 Shore Road site plan for 1,694 square feet of village retail be deemed complete. Second. Jim. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, moving on. Again, we're open to public hearing. Seeing no one here to speak, we'll close the public hearing. Um, any comments from the board? It's, I just have a question for Maureen. Um, Maureen, could you just briefly explain, because I know this, the, this was previously approved before um, the town center ordinances went into effect. Um, can you just kind of like explain how the change in the usage uh, either triggers site plan review or how this is 
uh, was going from a bank to a village retail store, um, what effects that has? Yeah, I, I mean, the, prior to the town center zoning, the regulation of changes of use were a little uneven. Um, if someone was changing their business from one use to another and the code officer felt it wasn't that much of a change, he would just let you do it. And then sometimes you would have to come in and get your approval. Um, like I said, a little uneven. So the town center zoning basically sets up a hierarchy where we list uses and as you, if you get approval for, for example, tonight, a village retail use, 1,600 square feet, and you wanted to have um, a different business move in there that was still under the category of village retail, you could just do it. Um, if you wanted to um, move a business in there that was in a, a lighter category, category two, um, someone wanted to open up an, a lawyer's office, um, you could just do it. And that's under the assumption that there are no exterior changes to the site. If you wanted to um, move out the retail use and move in a vet, a vet center, that's a more intensive use. It would still trigger coming back to the planning board for site plan review as a change of use, whether or not there were any exterior changes. Does that answer your question? It does. I have one other follow-up. Um, well, first of all, let's not have any more lawyers' offices in town. <laughs> Just point that out. It's not nearly um. enough right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but the other question is with regards to parking. Um, obviously, this has already been approved with parking. Um, but I'm assuming that when this was approved, like I said, the town center zoning was different. Um, now it's my understanding that any parking or when a building is built, that parking needs to be in the back. Correct. Uh, but is it because this is no changes in the existing building that it's, um, it's we, we're not we making that We haven't required, change? yeah, the, the town has not required people to remove parking that's already in the front. We treat it like a grandfathered use, but we haven't allowed people to add any, for example, the, um, the, the 1224 Shore Road site plan has two handicapped parking spaces in the front. There was a proposal to add a third space and staff recommended against it and the planning board didn't approve it. So we try to hold, hold that pretty tight that if you have existing parking in the front, we usually don't make people move it out but you're not allowed to put new stuff there. Okay. So the, par the parking literally has to be on the plan um, as it originally was approved. We haven't pushed that too far, usually if... No, I mean, I like mean on the old plan. On the, yeah, this is, yeah, and this is on the old plan. Okay. Um, this is pretty much exactly what the old plan looked like, except there's a, a dumpster in the corner now. Thank you. All right, no one sees a need for a site plan, a uh, site visit. Uh, I do have a question. Carolyn. The two parking spaces off to the side, the parallel ones, I don't remember seeing those on the, are those new or are those part of the original? There are two parallel part against the, the right. We, were, we right included side. those as prospective spots if they were needed. Okay, so they're not dumpster. currently existing, they're potential. They're not currently in existence, okay. but there's room for them, and we added those as prospective spots in the event that they're needed because the dumpster is taking up two spaces. Even without those, we, we comply with the, with the parking requirements. And this new, uh, is it fair to say, and I don't know if this is for the applicant um, or more for Maureen, but this basically takes the old um, approved planning board um, subdivision from 1988 and kind of modernizes it to our standards. Pretty much. All right. could, could, could I? Yeah. Yes. I just want to say those two parallel parking spaces are a little concerning because typically the, our, our off-street parking ordinance requires a parking aisle to have a 20-foot wide width, 24-foot wide width, and I'm not sure that from the parking space to the edge of the curb by the building, there's a 24 foot wide clearance. Mm -hmm. we and under the ordinance, I mean, this, uh, this particular use does not need um, to replace those two spaces that are lost from the dumpster. It's even worse than that because it looks like there's a paved raised island there. Yep. Yeah, there is. That's what I was. Um, so what you're suggesting is we should not have those on the plan that we approve because we don't 
necessarily want to see them happen. Uh, unless there's some sort of site plan I, review. I, I, I haven't, it. we haven't looked at them for compliance yeah. with the off street parking. My guess is if I had a scale and I laid it on here, there wouldn't be the clearance for them. Yeah. If I, could, if I could just add one thing. My client just mentioned uh, that those are actually two existing spots that are presently striped. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. And whether those were added subsequent to the site plan approval in 1990, I don't know. Well, they're not on the plan that you submitted. Um. So that would lead me to believe they're not probably not included on the 1990 plan, which is what the surveyor uh, was using as a baseline. Right. So is that code department issue? Well, whatever the board approves tonight, we would expect the applicant to uh, operate the site the way the site plan was approved. So when the code officer goes out there, if there's no space is shown in that area, he wouldn't want them striped. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So they should not be on the site plan? I, I can't, I, I think it will be difficult for the planning board to make a finding that the off street parking section of the zoning ordinance has been complied with without checking those spaces in relation to the dimensional requirements of the off street parking section. Hmm. And again, it, uh, there's no evidence that this site has a shortage of parking even without those two proposed spaces. So there's no, those two spaces are not on the plan that we're reviewing. The, the, app, the, the plan that was submitted by the deadline is the one that you have in your package. The applicant subsequent to submitting the application asked to install a dumpster. Um, I asked him to, to bring a plan tonight that would show the dumpster location. And the plan tonight not only shows the dumpster location, but also um, these two spaces on the side. So my expectation was that the board would consider a motion tonight to approve the plan that you got in your hands and add the dumpster. And if you just do that, then those two side spaces are still gone. Okay. Sounds good. All right, I have a motion. This is Go ahead. All right. This is for Caroline. Motion for approval, findings of fact. Number one, Seacoast Properties Incorporated is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Pond Cove subdivision and amendments to the previously approved uh, 12, um, 1234 Shore Road site plan that updated or that update approvals with current zoning requirements, which requires review under section 16-2-5 amendments to a previously approved subdivision and section 19-9 site plan regulations. Number two, the Pond Cove subdivision and uh, 1234 Shore Road site plan have been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and site plan regulations and the findings and decisions of those approvals, which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Number three, the subdivision will provide for adequate solid waste disposal. Number four, the subdivision does provide screening as needed. Number five, parking will be provided in accordance with section 19-7-8 off street parking. Number six, the development will substantially increase, or will not, excuse me, substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. Number seven, the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5 amendments to a um, previously approved subdivision and section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Seacoast Properties Incorporated for an amendment to the previously approved Pond Cove subdivision to remove a note in amendments to the previously approved uh, 1234 Shore Road site plan for 1,694 square feet of village retail be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that a dumpster be, may be installed at the southeast corner of the site and shall be screened on all sides with a wooden stockade uh, fence or slash gate. 
Do I have a second? Second. Give it to Caroline. Could, could I just add a point of clerical, clerical correction that the entity is uh, Seacoast Properties LLC, not Inc. Sorry about that. Okay. So I would Thank move you. to amend my findings of fact on uh, number one. Um, and the motion. And then within the, um, under the therefore be it ordered, any reference to Seacoast Properties, that would be LLC as opposed to Incorporated. I will second those changes. All in favor? It's unanimous, the motion passes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the last item on our agenda is? Which is not part of the meeting, you have to adjourn this meeting and go to a workshop. No, no public business comment. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone here who would like to make a public comment? Seeing none, I now would like a motion to adjourn. Jim? Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Meeting is adjourned. Do we want to do the...